it's my pleasure to bring forth you the welcome I greet you all in the mighty name of Jesus. I'd like to acknowledge the, our moderator, Deacon Ian Dixon, and also to acknowledge our pastor, Bishop Dr. Junior Rastan Headlam, and our guest speaker for tonight's training, Minister Leroy Hutchinson. Leroy has been working with youth for over 17 years. He has served as a youth leader at both local and parish level and is currently the National Youth Director for the Church of God of Prophecy in Jamaica. He's a Minister of Religion, Founder and Managing Director of Operation Youth Read Evangelist, Mentor and Youth Speaker who travels extensively to fulfill his international mandate in the Caribbean, North and South America and Africa. He studied at Jamaica Theological Seminary and is a graduate of the International Purpose Driven Youth Ministry. Leroy, along with his wife Anne Monique, has a passion to see this generation transform. Please welcome Minister Leroy. Hutchinson. All right, good night, everyone. How are we doing? Amen, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And, uh, you know, every time I hear that profile, I really have to just give the Lord thanks. It could have been a different story had it not been for Jesus. Amen? For all of us. And so Jesus is indeed the star of our lives, and we thank God for his grace. Let me use this opportunity to greet our moderator and also our bishop, Bishop Headlam tonight, and the, the team that has put this training together. I'm still trying to figure out how am I going to stay to speak because I have to go over. It's, it, it can't come out, right? <laughs> so maybe a card list would work better for me. Um, so while, while the, the technicians work on that, it's also a, a, a privilege and an honor to be sharing with you tonight, for those who are on social media, Facebook, we know we live in that time where people from all over can view from anywhere and view any service via the internet. And we thank God for those who are joining us on, on social media platforms. All right, so as we are here, we are here to discuss evangelism and strategies and things that we believe is our mandate as the church and as evangelists. All right, so we're going to dive right into it so that we can use our time properly. And uh, maybe if, w when I'm finished, you, if you have any questions, you could just share. You know, you can always jot down your questions and, and we... we can plan in. Okay. Um, you can just ask your questions for a few minutes. All right, so tonight, we're going to look at the topic, the missional supremacy of the Great Commission. It is so interesting that the song that was, that was sung a while ago is telling us to go. And that is indeed what we have been called to do. Somebody say go. All right. It is, it is what, we are, what we are able to do. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm free again. So we're looking at the missional supremacy tonight. And this is something that I teach because I believe in it. And I believe that we are called to make disciples also as we go to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Mr. Technician, whenever I say, you know, scroll, you can always scroll. All right? 
So really, as I said before, we're going to discuss this. We're going to look into it. It's, it's, it's something interesting that I believe can change lives if we, if we work on it. So you can scroll. All right, so when we look at that picture, what are we seeing? Talk to me. What are we seeing? Fruits, right? Fruits that, that look nice. We're living in a time where we have, thank you, healthy eating, and we're supposed to be eating up our fruits and everything. And I believe fruits are just, our, our fruit trees, our reproduction, they are just some of the things that comes to mind when we hear about fruits. All right? Tell me what comes to mind. What else comes to mind? I, I, mean, I mean, I know you are far away. Um, but things like reproduction, things like um, end result, things like, I mean, phrases like end result, or words like, tell me something else. Healthy lifestyle. You know, different things come to mind when you look at that picture. All right? So you can scroll. Scroll with me. All right, go again. Just a mission trip picture. You can scroll again. All right. So this is what the Bible said. John chapter 15, verse 8 says, By this my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And it's very important that we see as the church that evangelism and discipleship are not so far from each other. Though we are dealing with evangelism tonight, but you'll see how they work hand in hand. So Jesus was telling the multitudes and telling the people that by their actions, by their fruit, you will know if somebody is really a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen? We all agree to that? Amen. You can skip. All right, so our purpose, and we're going to look at the bottom line, right? So, number one, our purpose as the church, and I can't get tired of saying this, the number one purpose of the church is to evangelize, to win people for Jesus Christ to populate the church now the church also has functions right so you have the purpose of the church and that is still the number one thing that Jesus gave us now he left and when he was leaving in the book of Acts he said go into all the world and preach the gospel now I like to put it this way that if, if a parent is leaving home, generally, usually, the last thing that parent says would be the thing that she, he or she wants the children to honor. For example, mommy might be leaving and say, do not go into the pot another time, especially for Jamaican children, because <laughs> it's your father's food that is left in the pot, for example. And if for some reason, mommy figures that is a very important message as she turns her back. Am I not telling the truth? Or she would say, don't go to anybody else's house. Stay in the house. Because she's thinking a worst case scenario. And if she has one thing to say to you, it is, do not leave this house. And I believe that Jesus, while he was on earth, or while he was about to leave, he said what is very important to him. It was very, it's his last words in the state that he was. And he said, look, go into all the world and preach everything I told you. Preach the gospel. Baptize them and everything. So it's very important that we see here that Jesus had, had set a, a, a mandate, a purpose of why he gathered these men unto himself. And we are realizing that. Right? So the bottom line is, success for his disciples would be their commitment to the glory of God and the establishment of his kingdom. That's, that's one. Right? So success for his disciples would be their commitment 
to the glory of God and also the establishment of his kingdom on earth. And back then in the olden days, in the Middle Ages, when kings like uh, English and, and the French and these guys used to go out and they used to try to colonize places and establish their kingdom wherever. And the word crusade is not necessarily a church word. It is something that the middle-aged kings would do. They would go on crusades to win people and, 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 and bring and possess lands and, and fight wars and battles. So it is nothing strange that they wanted to establish their kingdom. So wherever the king of, 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 of France was and the king of, of England, even if he's not on the, the, his own land, wherever he was, is his territory something like the u.s embassy and embassies all around the world there's an agreement that that is their property and where the u.s embassy is that is the united states of america in jamaica and so they have established their uh, country and their principles and whatever they have that is their property right so number two the proof that the person readily so the proof that a person readily rather was a disciple glory of god let me say that again the proof that a person readily sorry really was a disciple um to glorify god in other words right all right we're gonna go to the next one we are called to prioritize one thing as disciples one thing as disciples no don't change the slide yes so we are called to prioritize one thing as disciples the glory of god and that's basically it as his disciples we are just here to establish the glory of god and i continue the glory of god will become manifest as the kingdom is increasingly established and so you will see us going into practical things, right? And the kingdom will only be increasingly established as Jesus' disciples aggressively, somebody say aggressively, aggressively commit themselves to bearing much fruit. So we hit back the same picture, right? So these things are very important for the Christian believer. That if he believes that the kingdom of God should be established, then it is our duty, and I use this word in the most um, careful way. God wants us to colonize our communities for his kingdom. Not in a bad way, you know, not to enslave anyone, but if we truly, uh, if we are sharing our lives and, and, and showing the world that we are disciples of Jesus, he wants us to colonize our surrounding. And that happens when we understand our job description or our responsibilities as a Christian believer, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You can, you can skip. All right? Waiting on the next slide. Yes. So, bearing much fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit, and we know in Galatians, the Bible speaks about the fruit of the Spirit. Right? So, you know that already. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, long-suffering, meekness, kindness, gentleness, all these things. He chose, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. And so these scriptures they are showing us again that as the church jesus gave us a responsibility now mankind the bible says is the first fruit right a kind of first fruit of all his creation and that in itself is very important because here we can see the responsibility of the church and how we should go after what god finds or sees as important people are redeemable 
even the guy who shot the lady in the church on Sunday morning, as much as we hate the act, look here, the guy is redeemable. And that's the, that's the, that's the harsh reality of, of evangelism for many people. Because you see somebody, you think they have done a wicked action or a wicked deed, but in God's eye, that person is redeemable. And the, and the role and responsibility of the church is not to judge, but to see, as, as hard as it is, to see every single person in our community as redeemable. The man on the corner, the guy with the weed, the guy who killed somebody. I mean, it's very hard to think about it. But if we're looking through the eyes of God, which, you know, we, we have to try sometimes, everybody is redeemable you remember brother paul who used to kill christians and he would go around and search for them and pull them out of their homes and 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 kill them and and receive letter to go and kill them look at him now we 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 talk about paul with the highest respect and he was a murderer amen yes but how many of us in our lifetime look at murderers and thinking you know this could be another paul you know this could be another apostle right so we really have to see people through the eyes of god and, and that is something for us to make note of the, you you will never be able to understand evangelism at its best unless you change how you see people people are redeemable we are not we are not we are not disposable we are redeemable amen amen so commitment to making more disciples that's fruit that we're talking about fruit no you know the fruit and we're still talking about evangelism right so but we can't understand our purpose unless we understand the fruit of what should come from us so we have to be committed to make more disciples uh, we continue where is the understanding the, the, the misunderstanding. Let me tell you where's the misunderstanding. Jesus was very clear. There's no misunderstanding here. Jesus was very clear. Very clear. We should go into the world and we should make disciples. He never said we should go into the world and have crusades, you know. He never said we should go into the world and just have street witnessing. He said make disciples. And that's his perspective of evangelism evangelism should be the, the 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 first part of making disciples that is why it's always important the end result of evangelism is discipleship amen but it starts with evangelism amen you can you can scroll so we're we're, we're continuing so to launch a global discipleship making disciple making movement in this generation I, I think we will have to facilitate a major reformation in the church that pre sorry that reprioritize and I want to emphasize on that word that is why I put them in red reprioritize it around the theological and practical supremacy of the Great Commission what am I saying in other words I'm saying if the church wants to make more disciples and wants to do more in evangelism we have to get back to the Great Commission I I was told of a story of a book there's a book called the Great Omission and somebody said and when they took up the book they were wondering how could somebody publish such a mistake <laughs> see he wasn't on it the great omission and you know the word omit means to erase and, and and all that and the person said um you know it's not omission because it's a mistake but the author was trying to say this is the greatest thing that the church should be doing that i believe the church is not doing entirely so it's the great omission the author called it but you can understand the twist to it because the number one thing that the church should be doing is to make disciples. Not to prophesy, not 
to do a lot of things. So what am I saying? I'm saying the church has a purpose, but the church has, a fu has functions. The purpose of the church is to evangelize. The functions of the church are like Bible studies, um, fasting services, prayer meetings, uh, fundraisers, getting together and worshiping together so that we can do what? Go back out. So when we come for Sunday morning services, it's not for us to, 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 to just, I mean, the church should be in proper standing, good pastoring, good leadership, all of these things. But remember, we're only here on a Sunday morning, maybe Sunday night. If we are really busy, we'll be here for a week having crusades or, or some empowerment service. But all of that is geared toward what? towards preparing us so that we may go back out into our workplaces, into our schools, on the buses, in the taxis, on the play field, wherever in our communities to win more people. That's why we get together, you know. So the Bible says, forsake not the assembly. Not because it is telling us that we should just come in and stay. Get together and sharpen each other that we can do what? Go back out. That's the purpose. The functions are very important. The purpose of a car is to move us from point A to point B. And it doesn't matter if it's the first car that was created in 19, I think it was about 08 or something, uh, or a 2021 BMW. The purpose has changed? No. It takes you from point A to point B. The functions might be different because of technology. Nowadays, you have Bluetooth in the car. You have the shocks are, are adjusted. Uh, you have radio. You have whatever it is. AC unit. It's different. The functions of the car, they, they are different from the first car that was created. But if your car cannot take you from point A to point B, it doesn't matter how much for it. It has no purpose. The only thing you can do is stand beside it and take some good pictures. <laughs> Amen. But the purpose of who drives, who, who, who keeps a car that can't take them from point A to point B? What's the sense? That's the church. We need to see the purpose. Right? So the Great Commission has been historically and universally accepted as the most comprehensive statement in the scriptures concerning the mission of the church. And we can't deny that. It is what we should do. You can scroll. All right? So all authority, Jesus said, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Can we all read this together? After two, one, two. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And that was a promise. That was a promise. And this also is what we call and what we, are, we, we know as the Great Commission. And it's one of the most important things that Jesus said before he left. The disciples were, to some extent, worried, wondering, what are they going to do now? He caused a lot of uh, division between his church and the government or and the people and the priest. And it was, to the disciples, a time to wonder what will happen now. You have stored us. We left our jobs. We, some left their families. And then you're leaving. You know, and so they, they, they were kind of scared. And I believe he said this to them because he wanted them to understand that, look, me leaving is not the end. It's not the end of what your mission is, your purpose is. As a matter of fact, a great part of accomplishing this purpose depends on my church. That's what Jesus is saying. A great part of the, the vision, the mission of the church. Because... This is it. God could have snapped his finger and saved the world. He could have just 
imagined it and it happened. Am I not telling the truth? He, he's all powerful. You know, so, so, so we see his power, but we also see, and we're going to dive right into it, the practical side of God when it comes to human beings. He could have done so many other things to save us, but he chose to do something else. So you can skip, please. All right? So let's look at this now. So we're going to go back right back to English class. So I put it like this, going. So the Bible said go, and when we look at it, we know that going is what? When somebody, it's a verb. It, it, it's, 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 it's telling us. It's an action word. You know, it says go. Can we go by sitting down? We can't go by sitting down. You know, I can't get tired of saying it because sometimes when we look at things, we have to understand that. You, you ever, I remember, you know, I remember Bishop telling me something about driving through some flooded area on, on, on Marcus Garvey Drive some, some time ago. He told me, and he said, Leroy, as I was driving, I was wondering to myself, you no, know, he said he was just driving and going through the water. And you know, when you're driving and you're going through the water, you're hearing it, and he's just saying, oh, Lord, please don't let this water affect the, the car, and he's driving and he's driving. And then when he's at the end of it, he looks in the mirror. I told him I have long remembrance, you know, so he will tell me things I know he will remember. I'm sure he's sitting there wondering, when did I tell him this? But he said he looked in the mirror, and, and then he realized the amount of water that he went through, and he's thinking, oh, Lord, I wasn't even realizing. So what am I saying? I'm saying that in the moment of time, you are doing something, but because of your passion and the zeal that you have, you don't even realize that you are doing it and what you're accomplishing until you paused. Right? And so evangelism and soul winning is a physical thing. You literally have to get up. I mean, I know that prayer works, but trust me, you really have to go speak to people. To win them many times. You could be praying for the community day and night. And I'm sure you, you know I believe in prayer. And I believe in prayer. But some people or people in general need somebody to attend to them. To go to them. To speak to them. To serve them. You don't even have to say Jesus love you sometime. Just go and be a witness of God's love. You can give somebody something. You can just do just about anything. Because ministry here is about demonstrating God's love through meeting people's needs. That's basically what it is. You can have a soup kitchen. You can do sports. You, whatever you do, it's going. So you are saying... I'm not just sitting down hoping that my community will know about Jesus. I'm not just sitting down hoping that my neighbor will know about Jesus. I am getting up and I'm going to go. So it's really an action word, you know. Jesus told them, and when he said go, it's not the Jamaican version or the U.S. version or the African version. It's, it's just a universal thing. It is go into all the world. They never had planes they only had some, some battered ships. Sometimes hard waves and, and storms just, just broke it apart. And you heard Paul's story. Paul said, we get shipwrecked. All kind of things happen. But they went nevertheless. They packed bags. Jesus sent them out. You remember when he sent them out two by two and he said, look here, go. And when you go, not carry nothing with you. Don't bring anything with you. Go and, and, and trust people. I'm not saying that you should just go now. You know. Some of you probably can't leave the country, can't leave, not just now, but you know, you have your nine to five or whatever it is. We're not saying that you have to leave your job because guess what? Your job is part of your mission field. You are not a doctor who happened to be a Christian. You're a Christian doctor. You're not a teacher who happened to be a Christian. You're a Christian teacher. You're not an accountant or a taxi driver who happened to be a Christian. You are a Christian taxi driver, Christian bus driver, Christian nurse, Christian accountant. Whatever you are, 
that is your field go and impact your neighbors go and impact your co-workers go and start a prayer meeting when it's time for devotion ensure that they can call on you to pray ensure that when 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 counsel is needed if you can't do it you have a church brother or a church sister that you can recommend to be a public speaker to be the, the speaker for your easter service the speaker for your christmas service this, you know somebody who you can invite you follow where i'm going you are you are you are supposed to impact your space and that's what jesus said to them go and impact your space wherever you are go all right so we see three things happening here go right therefore and that's what he's saying when he said um baptize them right so we're going to look at that so you have the chart right there we're going to explain it more you can skip please All right, so go interact with people where they are as the Holy Spirit leads. Have a redeeming identity. <laughs> have, have, have a redeeming identity. An identity, is, an identity that says God loves you. God, God loves you. You know, it, wiser than a serpent, harmless like a dove. People, when people see you coming, they should be thinking, oh, Lord Jesus, he's going to judge us. They should be thinking, oh, here comes God's servant, you know. He, he's packed with grace, you know. He's loving. He, she's kind. They, they can come to you with something and, and talk to you and so on. Because it, it, is, it is very important that we know how to go. We know how to approach people. I remember Heraldo, we had a youth retreat mission. I think it was Garden Pen. We had a youth mission, and Eraldo and this team, we, you know, had different teams going into different places. And Eraldo, when they came back, we had a report. You know, we had all the time of reporting. So Eraldo and his team, they said they went to this area in Garden Pen and saw some young ladies doing hair. You know, it's like this here just a yard. And he said he went up and he said, um, "Good day, everyone. Nobody." pay the many mind. Okay. Good, good afternoon. Eralda said, he said, no, good, you are going. Boy, good, you love over here. Look, though. Boy, good, you are going with things. You just are going. That's how he got their attention. <laughs> Why, good, you much you do the year. Boy, I just love it. That's it. And he got their attention because he changed his posture. He, he, he was able, they were able to identify with him. His speech, his, 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 his demeanor, all of these things. You can't just go looking like, oh, I'm from the church of God of prophecy and I'm packed with the spirit. <laughs> you know, you really have to. So you go to a mechanic. You, 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 you can't, he doesn't have all day. The man is fixing a car that he's trying to get over, you know. And so sometimes we go, we say, boy, you, you can continue doing what you're doing. We'll just pray. And we pray for the care. Father, whatever it is that is wrong with this car, Jesus, we pray that you'll reveal it to him in the name of Jesus. That will get his attention, especially when he doesn't really know what is wrong with this car. You follow where I'm going? You go and you see somebody doing her laundry and she doesn't have time for five minutes. You probably have to talk. You probably have to leave a track. You probably have to leave something. And so I'm saying, going, you have to have a redeemable personality. You know, you can't look like, oh boy, them forced me to come on the road. I didn't even want to be here. You know, God. it's because pastor say everybody should come. You can't go promoting a God that you don't trust. You can't go and say on your phone, why am I going to know you know? Why am I going to know me I serve God for And you are talking to persons. You know, so when you go out, it has to be. And when we say go, no, we're not talking about a particular day or time. We're talking about a lifestyle of going. When Jesus said he never said go on a certain day, just go. Right? And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name. So we see that. So let's look at baptize. So when we baptize persons, what we do after they are brought into uh, Jesus, right? So baptize is what we do after they are brought to Jesus, then they are part of a redeeming community. 
And that is why we baptize persons. That is why Jesus said baptized, because it's a redeeming community. It's a community of faith. It's a community that will help you to grow. So this, this part of the Great Commission is for the church to understand that people need to come and be a part of the redeeming community. And even if they're not baptized as yet, invite them to come and hear the word. Invite them to come and sit and listen. And even if they can't come, you carry the redeeming community with you you carry the testimonies with you you carry stories with you whatever bishop preached about on sunday you carry the sermon with you you carry the word with you and so you constantly walk with a redeeming personality because you are from a redeeming community amen so that is very very important that you understand that we understand you know I've gone to some churches many times on youth trip, and somebody might say, hey, Pastor, I don't want to be baptized again. You know, I baptized three times already. She's ashamed. She's embarrassed for whatever, you know, it is. Yeah, she's embarrassed. And you as you, we are all salesmen and women for Jesus. We're, Jesus is a product, you know, not to be exchanged for money, but He's a product because he supplies a need. Amen. You can have a good salesman and a bad product, and he sells everything. You can have a bad salesman with a good product, and he sells nothing. Because people don't buy products. People buy people. That's it. People buy people. You can be witnessing to your son and your daughter and your husband or a good friend and they don't even want to hear any more from you. And one person, because they just come in a different way. You can be selling a product and somebody buy the product, not because they even understand anything about the product. It's because you are the one selling it. And you have forged a friendship quickly, in five minutes. You talk about the man's wife. How is your wife? How oh, a long time in this year? You, you know, you, you talk about... You, so when you, when you approach people... I remember we approached a few guys in Clarendon. And, and they, they were ready to... They said, why well, pastor, who want, want to run a boat, you know? You know what Jamaicans call boat. And immediately, you know, came up with a few hundred dollars and I contributed... We had to tell those young men that we want to leave now because we have other people to talk to. They wouldn't leave. Because, you know, of the approach and how quickly we recognize that we need to adjust the moment in order for them to hear the word. I'm not saying that you're always going to have to do that. But I'm saying sometimes you have to adjust the moment in order for people to see and hear this redeeming gospel. Right? Because it's very important. Right? So we, we, we go. So I was saying, there are many times persons want to be, don't want to be baptized because of, they have done it two, three times already. And I would, look what I did. I would trivialize water baptism for what it's worth. Not in a bad way. I would say to her, do you love Jesus? She says, of course. I say, baptism takes about 10 seconds, probably 20 the most, depending on if the pastor is talking a lot. <laughs> Who knows? If you really love Jesus, you're just going to get wet. A few seconds, go change your clothes and come back out. But you can't call your name again. And she, a few of them, a couple of them, well, I use that line. And what I'm saying to them, baptism not save you, you know, it just shows your community that you're on a different path. What is 10 minutes of getting, 10 seconds of getting wet if you really love Jesus? And they went in the pool. Because probably the pastor was saying, no, you can't get baptized. You can't come in and say baptized again. Because the Bible said so and so and so and so. And there's a hard fist on it. Yes, I understand the principle, but guess what? I'm not the pastor, I'm the evangelist. So I come in to just help out the pastor in Bishop. And so my job here is to sell the product properly so that the person can overlook the trivial thing of what people are going to say about them, a four times she baptized now, so and so. Change the whole story. Put the perspective not on the water and the pool, but put the perspective on the love that you have for Jesus. 
And they switch many times. Right? So I'm just saying, sometimes what we argue about when we stand up talking to somebody is trivial. Somebody said they don't want to come to your church because it is, uh, they, they love Saturday. Guess what? All right. We can't even go on Saturdays, but let's still talk about Jesus. You know, I'm not here to have religious hard talk. Ian Boyne is no longer around. Right? We're just here to talk about something specific. And if not, you know, but we have, you know, engagement topics and so on. That, that's for another session. So teach one who is dedicated to the teaching of his master of a new life, lifestyle rather, of obedience. Right? So he's saying teach them to observe all things. Teach them to observe all things. Teach them to become one who is dedicated to the teaching of his master, right? And he will now have a new lifestyle of obedience. And so that is very important. As so we baptize, we go, we bring them in the community because we go with our redeeming personality. We share our redeeming community and we teach them how to have a redeeming lifestyle and how to honor what the Lord says, right? And the Bible says, you will be my witness. You can, you can scroll. Remember to signal me, Deacon. <laughs> All right, let's, I think, yeah, this is probably the almost final. All right, so let's look at making disciples. So a disciple is a follower of Jesus, transformed by the Spirit that makes disciples. Transformed by the Spirit that makes disciples. No, the Holy Spirit makes disciples. Discipleship is, is God's business. Jesus was the mastermind of the whole thing. He, when I look at him, when I study the word, when I just visualize what Jesus did with those guys, it's amazing how he took a guy like Peter, ordinary fisherman, no rocket science. The gospel and rocket science, you know? It is simple. Peter could understand it. Peter just an average fisherman. Never, he wasn't even as educated as Paul. You know, Paul was a young lawyer, Pharisee, understood the, God, the, 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 the Jewish law and he studied it. But Peter was just a man who, hmm, wait on it. But Peter had the principle that Jesus wanted to use in the world's grand scheme of things. Peter was a fisherman. He had patience. He knew how to wait. He knew how to plant. He knew how to wait. And he knew when to pull the net. That's, that's, that's his gift. He knew that. And he had a personality that Jesus wanted all of us to have. It doesn't matter if we are doctors, nurses, pharmacists, accountants. If we are not fisherman-like personality, then we cannot reach the harvest. We have to go. We have to wait. Right? So number two, making disciple is not a method, right? Or a class. It's not a class, you know. Yes, we can learn about it, but it's not something that we sit down and say, all right, I, get, I have a degree in making, in discipleship. I have a degree in making disciples. No, if you have never made a disciple, then where the degree for? It's just paper. So I'm just saying it's not about a class. Right? It is a lifestyle, a, a way of living, a way of living that one chooses. It's a way of living. So as evangelists, we are all evangelists. It's not, it's not a title that has been given to Valentine Rodney or Leroy Hutchinson or anybody else. We are all evangelists in our own way, according to the word of the Lord. Amen? So you don't have to wait until Bishop appoint you as evangelist. You don't have to leave all the work to the evangelism director and the, and the crusade director. We are all evangelists. We all have the responsibility to share the gospel to somebody else for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's, that's, that's our responsibility. So you have some people who say, oh no, you know, it's not my job. I leave that to the evangelism director. No. That person might just lead the charge when it comes to the corporate planning of how we go out, how we strategize, how we have a crusade. But really, we are all evangelists. And that's just the truth. 
Number three says, making disciples comes from a word whose root meaning, right, means thought accompanied by action. That's what making disciple is. Thought accompanied by action. So if we're only thinking it, then we're not really evangelizing, aren't we? If we're only wishing, you know, I wish I could talk to that young man, really. I wish I could just, I wish the power of Jesus has come down upon him and save him. But what you didn't say is that you wish somebody else did it. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I could just. It's not a wishful thinking. It's a thought accompanied by action. Evangelism has to be um, practical and deliberate. Making disciples is a thought, is, is, is taught rather, and learned by making, right? We have to make it. Apprenticeship. Mentorship. We have to find somebody. How many of us, we, there are people in our communities, there are people in our workplaces, there are people who we can take under our wings and say, guess what? You, I'm going to speak to you. The, the, Paul said we have many teachers, but no fathers. We have many preachers, but no fathers. And, and it is very important that we see discipleship, not just as a crusade setting, but those young men, for, for, for the grown men, get one of them. Speak to them. Take him under your wing. I'm going to teach you how to be a man. You know, if he doesn't have a father, that's even better for you because you become that figure for the women. You, you see a young lady and you say, guess what? Um, because only a woman can teach a girl how to be a woman and only a man can teach a boy how to become a man. And so that's what Jesus did. Uh, theologians said that almost all the disciples were under 18. Except for Peter and, and Matthew, they were already in their, their job field. Luke wasn't a high witness, so he wasn't even around at the time, with specifically with Jesus. But, but, but theologians believe that some of them were even as young as 15. Not like the grown men that we see on TV many times. Because in the way Jesus approached them many times, he calls them little children. And so it, it's, it's possible that they were young Younger than we see on, on TV, on the, the crucifixion movies. Because Jesus took them on at an early age for some of them. And he, he did everything around them. If Jesus is having a shower, I, I, when I was teaching um, the biblical interpretation, I, I told them. If Jesus was having a shower in the, in the river, or what, do you think there was a, a side for Jesus? And, and, and aside for the rest, no. Uh, he did, uh, never had any cell phone, no WhatsApp to tell Mary that 13 adult or young adults uh, were passing through and she should cook enough so that everybody can have something to eat. They just showed up. You follow where I'm going? He did everything with them so much so that they mimicked him. They, they looked like him. They talked like him. People couldn't even know them differently. Judas had to kiss him for them to really understand and, saw, and see rather who he was. That's because they patterned themselves. One, they were Jews and they acted a certain way. But two, they were disciples of him. And so he, he mentored them so, so wonderfully. And number four said, the emphasis of making disciples is not on fact or information that is taught, but on doing what has been learned. So if we don't leave this forum and decide to be more deliberate in disciple making and evangelism, it, it, it doesn't matter. It, it, this would have just been information. You follow where I'm going? Psychology says, if you don't start practicing something that you have learned within 72 hours, you're most likely not going to do it. 72 hours. So I'm saying, this is when you go and you see somebody and you speak to the person and you're not waiting for a crusade, but it becomes a lifestyle. Even without a crusade, you already, you are already speaking to somebody, right? So number five, making disciples cannot be done in a seminary classroom nor in a one week event it is a process of learning by doing learning by doing so 
Faith is practical. Disciple making is practical. Evangelism is practical. When, when I wanted to pray more, what do you think I did? Pray more. <laughs> There's no other way to pray more except to pray more. I had to set the alarm clock and I had to say, all right, I'm going to do one hour now because I'm tired of the half hour business. And when the alarm went off, I'm like, all right, because you know, sometimes you're barely, I make it to 55 minutes. And then as, as, as the time went and I practiced praying, sometimes the clock, the alarm went and I'm still in the middle of praying because I'm not done yet. I'm still praying until I'm able to pray much longer than the hello God by God. You know what I'm talking about, right? So is it, so it is with evangelism. The more you practice it, it's the more it becomes easier for you. The more you practice faith. Faith is also practical. You can believe God can do something for you today. And tomorrow you get up and doubt him. Not true? Yes. You can provide for your Monday and Tuesday you doubt him. You can provide Wednesday and Thursday you doubt him. Faith is practiced. You have to get up in the morning and say, guess what? I believe in you, God. And anything that comes, I will make a decision to believe in you. It's practical. Because things change. And that is why we call it practice. Lawyers practice. Doctors practice. You know why? Because situations change. A patient comes in with a different situation, and a doctor might figure, oh, I have seen this before. And then they realize, oh, I have not seen this before. So you have pandemic because they have never seen this kind of result in a certain kind of sickness. And then we realize we don't have a vaccine for it as yet, and the world in shutdown, because the, their practice was met upon by something new. But the principle remained on how to create a vaccine. You follow where I'm going? The disease was new, but there was a foundational principle that creates vaccine, even if it's a foreign illness, foreign disease. It's the same thing for us as believers and as evangelists. The principle remains the same. Go, baptize, teach. Now this guy might be a bit violent, but guess what? If I go, if I stay long enough, if I give him time, if I have patience then, and pray, the Lord will work out something. But the principle still remains. Go, baptize, teach. Finally, oh, you can skip. All right? Five more minutes to go. That's, that's it. I think there was one before. All right. So the, the, the big question is here, do you have a personal, specific, and intentional strate strategy of making disciples? All right? So that's, that's, that's a question for you to answer. If you have a strategy. You can have your own strategy with the same foundational principles, of course, based on how you meet people, based on how you talk to people. You can say to yourself, I guess what? I want to share the gospel at least five times for the week. You know, some people might say at least 10 times for the week. But you have to make it up in your mind that, guess what? I want to share with somebody, with at least one person for the day. I just want to... They, they don't have to be baptized... What we have to understand in a church is that the, the person being saved is not my responsibility. That's what I comfort myself with as a preacher. I could have an altar call with a hundred people. And if none of them say they want to get baptized, Leroy Hutchinson can put on the mic in peace. Why? Because I have done my part. My job is to preach. Study before, put the sermon together, present the gospel to the people it's their responsibility it's sorry it's god's responsibility to save that's why paul got personal paul said i'm glad i never baptized any of you so i can't call up my name he said i plant apollos water but who only god can increase the church and that is something that we have to understand because sometimes you will speak to somebody and you take it personal you know you take it personal the person never listen you out a man said, no, I hear nothing from you about Jesus. In bond Jesus. I know you in bond at Jesus. Jesus is big enough to manage himself. I tell myself, you know, I will never argue with anybody about the gospel. You know, you see God argue with nobody? No. When he's ready, he will save people. Right? So I share the gospel. If a man don't want to hear it, I respect his wishes. 
and I wouldn't, you know, because especially if somebody's getting violent or so. But my job, your job, is to present the gospel. Don't take it personal. Tell him what the gospel is all about. Leave him to mull it over. I remember the testimony of this Rasta man who a woman came and said to him on a bus, Jesus loves you. And him said, what a woman here going with, man? You know, and him run her away. But he's now testifying. He said when he got home, the phrase was in his head. All he could hear is Jesus love you. He's trying to get it out of his head. And that's all he could hear, Jesus love you. Until a few weeks later, he decided to give his life to the Lord. He got a haircut and he became a preacher. And he was sharing the story. He was sharing the story. All the woman did was to say, Jesus love your young man. And him run her away. She's, that, that's the, she delivered. She delivered the gospel. It was now God's turn to plague him with it. To, to let him have sleepless night. The Holy Spirit is the convictor, not you and I. We're just the messengers. Know your job description when it comes to the role of evangelism. You are just there to share the gospel, not to multiply the church. We can't do that. All right? So, so I, I wrap up here. I wrap up here. And the question is, is this part of your life and ministry? And that is for you to answer. Your life and your ministry right your life and your ministry yes question yes you can go ahead mike fine happening with evangelism is that most time especially whenever you call a evangelism meeting or we're going out to meet person there's usually not a lot of persons that come. And my theory behind it is that many times persons are fearful because they cannot deal with rejection. So they, in their mind, once they go out there, there should be some response, right? So how do you help us in dealing with that? I mean, it, it, it's also practical. It's a very good question, and it, and it happens everywhere based on what I see. But look at it this way. You can't ask a doctor to sell a car. He's not trained for it. You can't ask a car salesman to heal somebody or to, you know, operate on a person. Why? They're not trained for it. It's not a part of their lifestyle. When we ask persons to gather to go out, of course people will be fearful, especially if we are not practicing it. So not because we are saying we're going to have teams going out suddenly, somebody will have some sort of joy or know-how. The thing is, if we're not living a life of evangelism and discipleship making, there's no way within five minutes or ten minutes or an hour on the street you will find it comfortable. Am I not telling the truth, Bishop? Yes, it's a daily thing, you know. So if you, you are good at your job, I'm sure you never um, got to where you are in five minutes, in ten minutes. No, you have to study. You, you have to have sleepless nights and, and you have to go in the classroom if you're a teacher and teach. You have training. You, you understand? So I find one simple reason. We are not practicing one-to-one -one witnessing, one-to-one -one evangelism, one-to-one -one relationship with our community, with our co-workers, with whoever. Therefore, when we get together, it's going to be very hard because we're not practicing it. It's not a lifestyle. It's, it's not something that we do every day. So calling everybody together, it's just a, sometimes it's a, sometimes better five hours go out. Five who know how to do it because sometimes the next 40 is just walking, looking, observing the host. The boy, I want to build one house like that. <laughs> why would a boy that BMW up on the van look proper? A lie? You wouldn't buy one. That's all. And, and that's it. Only five people. And you will know when people are evangelizing as a lifestyle. And my God, you have to call them. I say, look here. We're ready. You can't talk to the whole community today. I go on some, youth mission, some mission trips with youth trip. And some of the members in the church. Some of the sisters, I tell you. My God, even me tired. And we do this almost every Saturday. 
One of the sisters said, let us go all the way down. I said, sis, we can't go no further. I kill we off. <laughs> You're going to kill us. She was up and about the shop. She, she wanted to go to every house in the community. Why? Because she do it on her own time. This is something that the lady, she do it. And we have gone to other churches and see people. The youth trip team can't manage them sometime with foot up one way. You follow where I'm going? You will know when people are accustomed to these things. Five minutes, one hour, can't change their mind. If it's not a lifestyle, we're going to have trouble. All right? Any, any, anything else? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right, so the, 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 the converted Rasta man who heard Jesus of it being repeated in his head, what do you think? Um, oftentimes, as Christians, we might find ourselves in conflicting situations. Somebody gets us upset, and we just say, out of an attitude, per se, Jesus love you, mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. Do you think it has similar impact? Uh, being said in that kind of a way, do you think it aids in the whole evangelism process? The statement, Jesus love you, you're saying sometimes it is mentioned in different contexts, probably in anger. Yeah. You're somebody across on the bus. Them step on your toe, whatever. Oh, Something yeah, I've wrong. seen it before. And you, <laughs> Jesus love you. So yeah, kind you of look a fun off kind of thing. I have heard the blood of Jesus against you. Yeah, that kind and of And two of them just you know, were cussing out each other. And then one I mean, the name of Jesus is still powerful. I guess Jesus would have to determine who he will bless based on who calls his name. But I don't think we should use it in vain for our own motive by saying, you know, go ahead, Jesus love you or, you know, do it with, with any ill intent. I think Jesus would still remain the, 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 the sole decider of, of the impact of his name at that time. But I've seen it in anger when people say it. It's only God who can decide on if there's going to be an impact or not. But it's not something for us to use for our own motive when we're angry. But who knows? It might just work. Not, not even unknowingly, it, it might work. Who knows? <laughs> yes, Bishop. Thank you very much, um, Brother Hutchinson. One of the things that I have discovered with Christians today is just our sheer inability to what I call communicate the gospel. You know, for us, preaching is this vex. You know, you go, you go preach, you go preach to them wicked sinner. Yeah. <laughs> and so we tend to go out with this vengeance because we are going to preach a gospel serious business. But there is, in my fact, I believe what Jesus really wants to communicate and wanted to communicate is to communicate the gospel. Yes, yes. Not to go out there and use it as some, as Deacon has said a while ago, some vex tool. Yes. So even within our families often, we cannot communicate the gospel to family members. The most we can say to some of our relatives who are not saved is that you have got dead and go to hell. Mm -hmm. You need to come at church because you know just that you're a wicked so. <laughs> we cannot communicate the gospel. Yeah. And I don't know what really is the cause of it. Perhaps we're not trained to it, but I really think what we need to do is to learn to communicate the gospel in our daily conversations. Yes, yes. Just as you said yes, yes. a while ago, our daily conversations must be filled with the gospel. Yes, that's, that is so true, Bishop. And to add to that, you know, I mean, we see life through our own eyes many times. It, you will have somebody, if, if you are a gracious person, I think you, will, you would be a gracious preacher and you will be a gracious communicator of the word, of, of the, you know, the gospel. In that, when you share it, you share it from a perspective of grace and not judgment. If you are a judgmental person, you will always see God striking down somebody for something that they do. You, you yourself will be very stringent on people when they make mistakes. Your kids, your husband, the, the gardener who clipped one extra leaf off the, off, the, off the tree. And you're thinking, what an idiot. How could you? You understand? 
so I, I believe the gospel is portrayed based on our personality. And for, for, for the judgment people, they will think that the gracious people only preach about grace. And you know, if you tell the people, them say they're going to go to hell. If, and the gracious person would think, but all you talk about is judgment. I, I believe a, we should have balance. We should, we should, while telling somebody, and that's why I believe the sermon from the lectern or wherever, on the street, wherever, is compact with love, uh, rebuke, and, and, and everything that Jesus um, pushes forth with it. Because Jesus' life is the gospel, you know. It's just that it has been lived over 33 years. The birth to the death sums up the gospel for us in five minutes. 33 years or 33 and a half years is summed up in an hour of sermon or, or five minutes of street witnessing. And so when you look at his life, you see a bit, of, you see mentoring, you see coverage, you see God protecting him in his baby stage, you see him shooting up, coming up, you see him protecting his people, dying, sacrifice, serving. You understand the disciples? You see him turning over things in the, in the temple when he realized that they were crossing a boundary. You see him, you know, looking at the manipulation, who is on the coin, give to Caesar what is Caesar. You see him being practical at the same time. Give, pay taxes, and give God your worship. He's a practical guy. And so the gospel is both spiritual and practical at the same time, in my view. It's both mercy. It's, it's, it's judging as well, but it, it's not for us to judge. Let the gospel, let people, and let, let me put it this way, let a man's decision to the gospel or his response to the gospel be his judge. So you, shall, you can rebuke, but rebuke in love. So the sermon is compact with all of these things. When the sermon is finished, be it five minutes or ten, or, or an hour, uh, the, the believers should feel empowered. The sinners should feel encouraged to make a step and stop living in sin. A fallen brother should feel like there's hope again and he shouldn't just stay down in the dirt. You follow where I'm going? So, so the, the sermon or the, the, the package that the gospel is wrapped in, the preacher has a responsibility, those who have been trained and those who are led by the Spirit, of course, has a responsibility to ensure that everybody in the congregation, both in the house and on the street, wherever, it, it is applied to your need. Wherever you are in your life, the gospel should be able to meet your need from one sermon. And so if you, even if you are speaking to somebody, a family member, whoever it is, you reflect Jesus and how he... So we preach the gospel, but Jesus lived it. Right? Because the gospel is everything that he went through, everything that he said in red in the Bible, and everything that he did, his miracles. We preach it in one hour, but he lived it. And that is why we preach him. We preach the gospel. Right? So... It, it is very important that we do that. I guess since nobody else don't want to ask any <laughs> questions, I'll ask, what role do you think love has to do with our approach to the gospel, love of people? Everything. Everything. And again, as we said earlier, we have to see people as redeemable. We, we have to love people. I mean, more, it's more than just romantic. Of course, he's not your husband. She's not your wife, or probably your blood relative, or somebody that you really like. But the sinner or the unsaved person, if we project, if we are looking through the gospel, we would love them. If we're looking through the gospel, because there's never a person in the Bible, especially in the gospels, that Jesus gave an ugly face, especially if they need help and they were living in sin and everything. Jesus treated them with love. And love is the number one, number one criteria for everybody who shares the gospel. The gospel was built on love. For God so loved the world that he gave. It was because of the love that God had that moved him to do something physically, to demonstrate his love to the world. Sinners. All of us gone astray. And the Bible says, in that, while we were yet sinners. Me, 
while we were sinners, you know, he came and died for us. How much more after we stop drink and stop fornicate and stop do this and stuff, how much more will he love us? If the man died for us while we were sinners and didn't even care about him, how much more will he do for us after he had bought us with a price? We really have to love people. And as I said, Bishop, is the number one thing I believe that will reach and save people. Love. Thank you again. Um, pardon me for coming to you more than once, but because Basically, I'm a part of the evangelism team, so I know what it's all about when you're called evangelism media. We really want to empower the brethren so as to go. Now, you, you touched on a part in your presentation that spoke about um, being impactful. And each time I, I think of that, I, I, I always look at us as Christian, that many times we, we, are, we, we, we are not operating as we should, especially as evangelists. It's because even at our workplace, persons don't even know that we are Christians. Mm -hmm. Even at our homes, some of us we have uncles, brothers and sisters and cousins that are not Christian, yet we have never mm. shared the gospel with them. And I, I, I find that troubling because I practice that. Every one of my family member knows that I'm a Christian. So even going out here to share with others, it's not hard. And I think that one of the things that we need to look at, some of us perhaps, is are we really spreading the gospel amongst our family? Yes. Are we letting the persons around our workplaces or wherever we are know that we are Christian? Because I believe if we practice this, as you said, it will become a lifestyle. Yes. It will yes. become a norm. And, and quite frankly, it's really loving people because we know the truth. And if we love people, then we wouldn't want anybody to face the judgment. Mm -hmm. Therefore, mm -hmm we would go and, 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 and feel it free to go and spread the gospel. So I thought I should just yes, yes, bring yes. out that. Which is true. It, it, is, it is very important to do it daily and do it with. And sometimes your family members are not the easiest to, to witness to, you know, because they know you're from your young. <laughs> Some of them don't even believe that you are fully converted. <laughs> but, but you just have to cut say again lifestyle yes yes because if you sleep they're the first set of people to know <laughs> yes so that's that's true all right good night again um i recall what in in your presentation very good the onus is on us to realize that we are all evangelists and that is true coming up in the church um i remember we had specific strategies. There were really set out teachings to equip us as young people to evangelize. So you would have things like what we call, and I still talk about this, like you like team, which would really equip us as young yes, people yes. to evangelize. Is it that the weakness that we are seeing now, that um, we say that sometimes we're going out and a lot of persons don't want to come, that some persons think that they are not really equipped. They, it's not that they don't see themselves as evangelists, but they are not really equipped. It, to what extent um, our learning the basic scriptures and um, going back to, to really equip ourselves, to what extent as a church we really need to go back yes, yes. to this sort of foundational teaching to help our persons. Um, Yes, I understand. I mean, I think that over the years, the church has become departmental, where we have specific people for specific things, that if you, if you compare it to the early church, it wasn't really so. For example, we have prayer warriors. I mean, everybody should be able to pray. You know? You, then you have... So, so though you have people who lead a certain uh, ministry in the church, which is good, 
you, it is not, it, it, I don't think it should have been so compartmentalized where some people think, oh, I'm a part, I'm the evangelist or I'm the head of the evangelist group or I'm a part of the evangelism team and therefore because of that I do this but those who are not a part don't see themselves as doing it because the early church as you look at the book of Acts it was everybody do it. the Bible said they worship daily in homes they sold their possessions and and give and the Bible said the church increased daily daily somebody saw remember no, no even if the persons are not Christians at the time daily people were added to the church because they never saw it as crusade. They never saw it necessarily as well around a one-week crusade and so much souls we can win. They thought, guess what? We have to live a certain kind of life and we have to incorporate the entire community. And when the community saw how we were living, the community said, hey, guess what? You don't need to be a part of that group. And daily people were being added to the church. That's, that's what Acts said. So it's clear that the church back then, the early church, really saw everything as one. We're living as one, as a set of believers, and so we're sharing our, our spiritual liberation with, with everybody, whether goods, food, whatever it is. And because we have done that, people want to be a part of us. So it is, it is very important that we, while we know we have departments in church, not everything is about a department. Though you might have a leader for a department, you know, but really, again, evangelism is for everybody. Though you might have somebody who spearheads a seminar, uh, a spirit, and call in a speaker and say, guys, let's meet and listen, so on. So it's really for everybody, just like prayer. Yeah. I don't know if salvation these days is the same as salvation when people like me got saved. Because when I got saved up in Mount Lebanon, it was almost like a given. Nobody had to tell you to, yes. that you had to be a part of these, these things. You never knew what to say. You, nobody, um, well, nobody sat me down and told me that these are the texts that you need to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it was a given that the church is into evangelism mode. You go, you, you, you watch people, you observe what people are doing. You learn from people. Obviously, perhaps the, the system could be better yes. tuned. But the fact is that there was something that was inside of the new believer that propelled them to want to be engaged with prayer, want to be engaged with witnessing, want to be engaged with the spiritual disciplines of the church, which really is something that is very lacking oh, yes. in our church today. Um, it, it just does not exist. Even some of us who have, were brought up into that culture have deviated so far from it yes. that we have no authority to speak to the people who are coming in now. Mm -hmm. So those of us who have been in the church and knew or know what the church was then and how that impacted our mission, when you look at our church, the Church of God of Prophecy, with what, over 300 locations in Jamaica, if you count within the past maybe 20, 25, 30 years, how many of those locations have come on board as against the number that came on board in the early in the yes. inception of the church. Yes. You would have seen the disparity in this church that is so modern, we are so educated, we have so much more money. I mean, when you come here on a Sunday morning, sometimes you think it's a convention, the amount of cars parked in the parking lot. But at the same time, our output when it comes to these evangelistic activities is so minimal comparing to what our our predecessors did with so little. I mean, I remember as a child when I got saved, we sometimes had to walk for miles and miles to go to do ministry. I mean, we had to go across the river, we had to carry shoes in our bags, we had to do all these things to go and do ministry. Today, What, what caused that, Bishop? It was just a culture in the church. Yes. You, you just never thought that you shouldn't be doing it. Yes. That's it was almost like, how could you not be doing this? You, you are inducted at the same time. Exactly. But today, you find that the culture has shifted so significantly that it is impacting every part of church. And 
No matter, for me as a pastor, no matter how you preach and teach, some people just don't pay any mind. So God, I guess, would have to speak to them from heaven, like up on Sinai. <laughs> but the, the fact is that the culture has shifted so far from what we are accustomed to. And some of us have to begin to bring back that culture, right? So events, I, I, I'm just responding to what Minister Dean said. So the, the mm -hmm. compartmentalization of the church has impacted it somewhat, but we've always had those, those, those compartmentalization. The only thing is that in that culture, everybody saw themselves, the, 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 yes. what is it, the department, was only the organizer. Yes. But the entire church was pulled into yes. that direction. Yes. Today, the entire church sits down and say, well, we have five people to go, and they're the evangelism team. We just come on a Sunday morning and look pretty. Yes. And, but the, the, the next question I want to ask, though, isn't, isn't that a sin? Because if the something says a great commission, and we are doing the great omission, isn't that disobedience to the Lord? I mean, I don't know, maybe you're, you're, the, you're the authority here in evangelism. <laughs> maybe you, you can maybe answer that question. But um, it is something that we really need to consider as Christians because some of us might think that we're doing well and we're going to stand before God and God is going to give us a crown of life. But he might say, I don't know you. It's a disparity for real, yes. It, it's, 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 it's a missing link to what the church should be and we can see the impact you know i said i said the other day when when i, I mean i was moved by the thing i mean the entire church should be moved by what happened on sunday right across jamaica i mean baptist methodist seven day adventist pentecostals it doesn't matter for me it was a multiplicity of things including i said what is it that we have lost as the church because we, we can't just depend on the minister of security to impact and the police force to impact these young men the church has power we have the holy spirit one but we also have the know-how to go and make some of these young men into disciples go and transform them speak to them talk to them build relationships with them they all might not be saved but the church has the authority to do something about it. We can play a major part in the development and the transformation of this culture. One, because a lot of them, these guys, they, some of them don't even know church. They don't even, under, many of us say, boy, they don't even respect church anymore. No, probably those guys, <laughs> they're like 18, 19, 20, 21. Matter of fact, they don't even know what it is to respect church because they, some of them parents not even took them to church they just saw church from the outside our grandparents would understand what used to happen when guys back then respect church even if they are not christians they would turn down the sound system no dance hall would be on a sunday and you can tell especially the older ones but as we as we are coming up now we realize it's not that they have lost respect for the church these younger ones they don't know they never had it in the first place they have not lost anything. They never had it. And so, if we sit back and think that they're going to respect something that they never had in the first place, we're going to get the end of it. Because this is where the church needs to become mobile. We need to go and bring the respect, bring this gospel and show them why it is a respected gospel, why it is a transforming gospel. Because as we are seeing now, the, 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 the building is no longer an emblem of respect for this generation. They will walk in and shoot and walk right back out. And we come and we say, God, you should have made him drop on the ground. You should have made him just drop right there and come up. The guy don't even know the power of Jesus. He never lost anything. He never had it. His mother or his grandmother understood what church and how it should be respected. The church has to become more mobile, just like the, past, the, the passport, uh, passport, mobile 
thing come out and blood bank and, and all these organizations have their little mobile library, the library and everything. Why? Because they realize that people can't bother to come there sometimes and, and in a certain area they are selling an idea. NCB comes out and, and NHD and they bring out their mobile group and they bring the service to a certain community and they transform the community because they never have no bank account. They never thought about owning their own home unless NHT mobile group goes into the community and, and Heart Trust and all these people go into a community and transform the perception of the people because the people wouldn't go to these organizations because they're not used to it. So the church need, and that is why our mobility is very important. It's very important that we bring the church to our communities, to individuals, to people, Bring love, bring the relationship, because that's what people really, really want. It doesn't matter how I'm wrapping up, I'm done now. It doesn't matter how much we know via information. We will never be able to create more disciples unless we really talk to somebody and share and have a relationship, healthy relationships with people as a group or as individuals. And so I do hope and trust that we have learned and we are able to bounce ideas off each other and, and we're empowered and ready to go. Practice. Practice it. Speak to somebody tomorrow. Talk to somebody. Share. Some, the fear. Let out the fear. You know, sometimes we know we have people who are afraid to talk to people. And sometimes it's just a phobia. But guess what? If you know you have a good product and you know it's worth telling, find a nice way to tell it. You know, and, and let somebody know that Jesus lives. And my dad is not a Christian. And the other day I was coming home and I said to myself, Look, he's a good guy. I said, Lord, please, let me kind of go ahead. Please. I was talking to God. I said, Boy, I, I think my father is a good guy. It's true, he's, he's, he's nice, good guy. But I said, God, I'm praying. I would talk, we discuss everything. Christianity, you'd have to feel like I am, buddy. <laughs> He's the national youth leader. But, you know, we have our conversation. But I'm praying for him still. I have to keep engaging him in conversations and praying that the Holy Spirit will allow one day the transformation to happen. He comes to sermons that I'm preaching. He comes anywhere I am and so on. But I'm just saying this because out of love, I'm saying, God, do something. And that is how we should love people, not just our family members but people who are trying to build such a relationship with. So God bless you both here, social media, and I do hope that we have been impacted tonight and we will put it into practice. Amen. Bless you.